about two or three weeks ago, I diverted from what I was going to speak on and suddenly put something together on rejection. I wasn't quite sure why, but I'm not going to say it was any deep spiritual conviction. It's just what I did. And I forgot what a big deal that was because I got a ton of feedback where people said, you absolutely put words to my struggle. And I remember the first time that that happened for me. Um, I remember exactly where it was. Pastor Jimmy Jack from New York spoke. He preached and I stood in the back and I was just a wreck. And it was on the spirit of rejection. And then I find out as I go through prayer ministry that that's actually my what they call the strong man, the gatekeeper in my life, it was rejection and fear of rejection that were the, the two strongest. And, and then I find out there's a group around them too that are equally <laughs> hard to deal with. But I had a lot of issues in this area. So I decided, as much as I don't like talking about it, I'm going to talk on some of the other pieces around rejection because I realize it is very much a problem for a lot of people and you don't know what you don't know and you think that you just have a miserable way of experiencing life but there's actually a reason and there's um, there's a lot of reasons why it's like that but it also grows into more things and there also is a way to tear it down. So that's really why I'm bringing it up. But the medical news today reports that fear of abandonment is not a standalone mental health condition of its own like depression, anxiety, but it's so strong that for many it's actually a phobia. And a writer named Jessica Sum wrote an excellent summary on this topic and I'm going to use a bunch of what she wrote because I'm not going to recreate something any better and I'm it's just critical that I communicate this as well as I can and I'll put the link of her entire writing in the comments so that you can see everything but I had so many reach out when I spoke on rejection that I did want to take it a step further because rejection by itself does not explain everything that goes on. There's a very complex mix of issues around that and with patience and perseverance, you can bring it into the light and you can get great healing this side of heaven in that area. Certainly make your life and your relationships a lot more um, a lot less painful and complicated and I'm not an expert in the area of dealing with rejection abandonment but I'm an, an I'm an expert in experiencing this area I think from what I know I was born with this whole area locked in I I I just remember nothing else. I don't remember ever being different. I showed very clear patterns all of my life of having an internal limit to what I could bear and then just disappearing when that limit was hit. And there was probably early trauma that set that limit, but I also, probably because of the nature of the family dynamics and also my personality, Different things obviously play into this. But I had many occasions where I'm there one minute and I'm gone the next and people never knew what happened. But I, I just maxed out. I just, I cannot take any more. And I don't have a full understanding of that yet because there was many triggers to that. But I do know that I still work very hard to not let that happen without making very good choices in advance. It's a trauma response. It has a lot to do with the great fear that I have of people getting inside my life. That's never been a safe thing for me. And most times it has not been. 
and a lot of people share that and this goes back again to the beginning and I <laughs> learned from a child age to run run fast hide and never come back that's kind of my way of dealing with people that I I can't be around that person and I started warning people in my 20s because I I actually this was well in place by then but I I already knew I was causing quite a bit of damage by then and I also was experiencing a lot of damage and I would tell people that I I have this way about me that I don't really know at what point that's going to happen but when I can't take anymore I'm gone I'm just I disappear I'll even leave the state like I'm just gone and I I felt like it had control of me I didn't understand it I didn't have any way to know what it was I just knew that these things happen and i am gone to a whole different town or city within a few hours I've done a lot of extensive work on this area since I became aware of what it was. But at the same time, just like I feel that my early alcoholism kept me from committing suicide at a young age, I feel like this problem probably saved me from some very disastrous relationships that could have even cost me my life that would have moved to the point of I was already trapped and it would have gotten a lot worse. And so I had a, I had an escape hatch where the bottom drops out and I'm gone that got me out of some pretty tough things when nobody was thinking that I was gonna do that. So I believe it did save my life a few times. I've had some very long relationships in my life, so I know it's possible. I know that most people can't figure out the type though and I can't either because there doesn't seem to be a type to the relationship that really works for me. It's a, for me, it's a safety. It's a, a safety thing. And I, I don't, I can't quantify that completely. I'm very introverted and many people don't understand that about me because they see me as an extroverted person in ministry, which is deceiving because I'm very introverted. I hate talking socially. I absolutely dread phone calls. I, If it's a phone call where somebody is hanging from a bridge, I'm all in. But if it's a phone call where somebody just wants to see how I'm doing, I would rather stick a pencil in my eye. And so I don't like to visit for just chatty social reasons. I don't go sit and have coffee unless you're bleeding. I don't have any desire to do that. I'm drained by social relationships, just drained by them. And I love being alone. <laughs> I really love being alone. I love doing things alone. I love, I love being alone. So I, I could be on an island easily give me a cat or two and i'll be fine i i really i don't know if it's that i'm defective or if that's just something i don't know but i'm i do fine alone and then there's relationships that i get into just because life does that and then it starts out this certain way and i've given them this warning of these certain things that i can't take this intensity that comes from certain people and especially the kind of people that we are, I tell them, please don't, don't do that. Don't start pushing. Don't start saying, what are we? Or trying to get me to define a more, don't try to push because I, I get really kind of freaked out by that. And um, I tell people, don't do that. Let's just stay completely without expectations and we'll do amazing. And I can say that, but then they will start at some point to develop some expectations and then I'm heading to crisis right away because I no longer want to be in the relationship. And I will warn them and I will warn them and I will say, I can't do this. And they somehow think I can grow or I can get, I will care enough about them that I can, but it turns into the same thing every time where I just end up 
exiting sharp right because I I'm I just I'm so introverted I can't take these high pressure relationships that want to be so close I can't do it and I'm in a crisis by that point already so there's not really any way to figure it out I will credit my husband as probably being the only man that ever studied that carefully he saw that in me I don't know if he actually identified it as a mental illness or not but he could see that this was there was some things going on there but he's a very skilled profiler by trade and so he he just has from the beginning never pushed or never tried to steer or or he he just didn't he still doesn't when I was 42 years old, that was the first time I lived with a man I was in a relationship with and married because I was not able to do it prior to being 42 years old. And I was not a decent person. I just could not be trapped with a person unless they were just somebody I wasn't that close to. I just did not like relationships like that. I know people are probably really worried about me right now, but it's just true. It's how convoluted my life is in that way. And people just don't either know because I don't talk about it or, but it's a serious issue for me and it always has been. And so I'm really grateful for, I guess, I guess I'm just so grateful for Kevin because he gets it and he doesn't, he doesn't press on it and he, he just gives me wings and lets me follow my passion and I'm, I'm grateful that there's a place for me. And so I know that there's got to be other people that have these kinds of things, but I just know I've never really been that talkative about it. I, I just keep a lot of that to myself. I don't understand it, but it's the, very much true about me. A lot of people, nearly all people, have some level of fear of being abandoned or left behind by others. And this fear can be so crippling in every way, even spiritually, that if it is not nailed to the cross, it will prevent us from trusting God and loving people, the two very necessary requirements to be a disciple of Christ. Fear prevents us from experiencing and demonstrating God's perfect love. And the fear of abandonment is a self-fulfilling curse for many. When we subconsciously worry that people are going to leave us, we can struggle to let anybody even close to us because we're already preemptively protecting ourselves from the disappointment, the upset, and the hurt that we know is coming because they're going to leave. If they get close enough to us, then they're going to leave for sure. For some, even ordinary partings can bring that anxiety or sadness. And as a consequence, we withhold love because of all the fears that we have. And we calculate what we receive compared to what we give because we don't want to open up to people who aren't going to make this a safe exchange. So we're very, um, we're very, um, we're examining these things right from the beginning. And unfortunately, such unhealthy self-protective ways only drive further disconnection rather than intimacy with other people. We send off signals that push people away. <laughs> As people withdraw from us, our fears are then reinforced that people will always leave us. And those of us who are highly sensitive, we also overreact when we encounter people's healthy and natural boundaries. I had a lot of confusion about boundaries. I probably still have a lot of confusion about boundaries. We can take it personally when people create um, safe space for themselves. We get upset, bitter, vengeful. And I am now on the other side of that where I've had to learn about boundaries and so I was the one before who people would say you know this is just too hard of a relationship I don't even know how to get along with you 
and then I get mad because they made it about me and now when I try to take safe space from someone and I make it about me so they don't get mad because I know how that goes they still get upset bitter and vengeful it's a really tough area and abandonment is such a soul wound that it just brings out about the worst qualities a person could have and our fear of abandonment becomes a self fulfilling mess of things because we end up fearing the very thing we crave which is a deep connection whether or not we want it with people or god or however i am the type of person that it needs to be a deep connection or i'm not in i am not into surface things at any level so then we develop these behaviors to cope with our fears one is we abandon others we give up on relationships first so that we are not the ones that get abandoned we are antagonistic we despise and even hate others who we feel have let us down we're arrogant we harden our hearts and convince ourselves we don't need anybody we are closed off we expect or demand that people earn the right to be close to us. We're codependent, we cling to others and become emotionally reliant on them, meaning if they don't answer their phone, you start blowing up their phone. Hypersensitivity, we tend to react strongly to even minor slights and assume the worst of people. So offense is a very easy thing. Judgmental, we make a habit to analyze and judge people's motives and characters as a means to assume the worst about them rather than use the discernment as a basis for prayer love and uplifting counsel and this is something probably a perfect storm i have created for myself in that i i most often respond to the greatest crisis that's reaching out to me but when you have multiples of that happening all the time and the person can't get hold of you suddenly because you're helping someone else and they're in a crisis, they will become very upset like you just drop them when you didn't, you're just not carrying your phone around staring at it, you're helping someone else, but they just assume that because that's the damaged state they're in at that moment. So it it's a pretty common thing that they start to know what people are thinking or feeling and it's always against them isolation we avoid relationships completely when we're feeling a certain kind of way we just shut everybody out manipulation we try to manipulate others and keep them from leaving us we all know how that goes perfectionism we try to control whatever we can to the best of our ability so no one can tell us that we've fallen short or reject us performance we're driven to prove we're worthy of others love and respect and never feel secure because we never know when we have done enough people pleasing we try to win others approval by making them happy self-abandonment we will do anything to avoid rejection at the expense of our own identity and what we need transitory we go through relationships at a rapid pace and keep them short enough so that we avoid feeling abandoned. The fear of abandonment typically develops as a result of something that happens in childhood. And there's a, a very wide variety of roots to this where we felt we had no one to go to for comfort and reassurance. Or we may have been dismissed when something was at a level where we really did need help and we needed someone to listen or help us get through it but it was minimized and it was not seen as a legitimate need that can also cause so much confusion in a little person without necessary guidance and reassurance from parents and guardians 
children's brains cannot draw the right conclusion and they are left feeling worried, stressed out, and very alone with things that could have been resolved quickly by somebody just sitting there and giving them five minutes and helping them out. And this fear of abandonment can even develop in infancy if a baby is born premature or critically ill and they're put into an incubator, they're left in the hospital for weeks, and they don't have the voice of their mother who they have already connected to before they were born, that can also develop into a fear of abandonment. Feeling emotionally neglected can be just as painful as being physically abandoned. And sometimes emotional abandonment can be even worse because we're made to feel that we're not worthy of even a small amount of time or effort by those who are actually physically right around us. They didn't leave and not come back. They're right there ignoring us. And not all emotional abandonment is intentional. Sometimes it's circumstantial. So guardians may be unaware, unprepared, negligent, depressed, sick, stressed, grieving, and so forth, and they don't even realize that the child's needs are being ignored. And nonetheless, it can result in what some call an orphan spirit in children. And I'm going to speak on that probably next because that's also another very big identity problem that many of us had. It can be overcome, but it's until you know what that is, it's a real problem to work with in your relationships. Other possible causes for a fear of abandonment are uh, a parent dies or leaves all of a sudden and the child is left feeling abandoned or anxious that other loved ones may leave us too. So if there's one of the parent leaves and then the parent that they're with goes through relationship after relationship, they just become accustomed to they're going to leave. You just It's just a revolving door and it really messes up what they see as true and expected. And guardians dismiss general when you have legitimate fears, when you're trying to, when you have a need and people can see that you have a need as a child and you have to sort them out yourself and decide what's going on often leads you to a very wrong conclusion and very defective core beliefs about yourself. And children are left to grow up and learn many things on their own when there's no help, correction, or guidance. So it's very important that if you have children that you are prepared to give them that because otherwise they're going to grow up and they're going to have a hard life as a result because most of the personality of a person is formed by the age of four and so the problems that they already have processing by that point are going to carry on into their adult life and sadly what people don't consider is that the pursuit of wealth or success by parents often comes at the cost of their children's emotional well-being. And parents spend long hours away at work, leaving their children in the care of extended family, domestic helpers, or perhaps babysat by the TV or their phones. They get them phones when they're young. So these children know that there's something more important to their parents than getting to know themselves. And I remember a young woman, she actually was staying with a neighbor who came to see me. She was a young, they were teenagers at the time. And she had, there was something with her arm that was so, it was just really hard to see and very, um, mild young woman i mean she didn't look any certain way she looked very mild and dressed mild i mean there was nothing about her that was striking that way and i worked inside treatment at that time so i knew there was something really peculiar about her arm self-harm of some sort i just couldn't tell what it was and so i asked her i said can i ask how you how that happened and she said that her dad is an attorney and he has a very important job and her mother 
um, works at the school where this young lady goes to school and it's some kind of a charter school and she said she has a very important job too and this young girl was adopted by these two people because they were not able to have their own children and so they have adopted her but she said she sees her dad about once every couple of weeks because he's really busy with trials and her mom she sees for a little bit in the morning so she has a pumice stone and she rubs her arm she just keeps rubbing her arm with this pumice stone. And I said, what does that do for you? And she said, it reminds her that she can feel, which is common for people who self-harm. And I thought, I wonder why they adopted her. I wonder why they did that. She has no siblings. And here her, her arm is just rubbed raw. The skin is off her arm and she has parents that are successful and apparently nobody's asking the questions i i just will never forget that children naturally want their parents affection but are usually told that their parents are busy working for their own good leaving them feeling conflicted and forced to suppress their legitimate desire for emotional connection with their parents because they're told the reason they're not getting it and getting what they need and want from their parents is because the parents are busy working to give them what they need. School, nice clothes, college, these things are dangled over them like, you're not gonna have that if I don't do this. Which is another wrong thing to do to a child is make them feel that they're the reason why they feel so abandoned. Because they'll go grow up and blame themselves for every wrong thing that happens in their life and then when parents do spend time at home they're exhausted distracted irritable and oftentimes emotionally abusive because they're exhausted distracted irritable and the kids suffer with the uncomfortable sense of being cast aside by their parents in favor of other things that they're told is for them that makes them feel they are the reason that they feel so alone Time, care, and affection are very crucial for a child's self-worth, and none of these things can be bought with money. So guilty parenting, which is a common thing, a very common thing is very damaging to kids. So if you're not ever home, and then you bring them gifts when you do come home to try to make yourself feel better, or you... The family splits up and the parent that doesn't spend quality time with the children brings them gifts and they think well the kids love this but you have no idea what's really going on in them most will grow up in counseling and say they had no choices they would have much rather spent time with their parent than get all the gifts gifts will not replace quality time and it will not create a healthy child. The child won't have a good self-worth from that trade. The kids associate love and time with expensive gifts at that time, if that's what they're shown, and this causes some very messed up adult expectations from life. Children are a very priceless gift from God, trusted to you to raise, not something to place second to anything except Jesus. Their value must be reinforced at home, and if it isn't, they'll become adults with some very wrong core beliefs that will lead them into heartbreak after heartbreak, and no amount of nice things is worth setting them up for a life of pain that they believe is remedied only by getting more stuff, more stuff, more stuff, as they were shown that more stuff is worth more than they are. Other possible causes for a fear of abandonment can be a health crisis in the home early on, financial crisis, traumatic loss, a marriage crisis at the home that left them feeling emotionally unsafe, unprotected, afraid that they were gonna lose their parents, even if it was just one, or parents who constantly threatened to separate thereby traumatizing and creating deep fear that there's nothing 
tomorrow could be the day. They just live on edge. Physical, verbal, or sexual abuse has left them feeling unprotected and left to suffer on their own. And sexual abuse destroys a life. And it doesn't need to be sexual abuse culminating in sex. It can be violations. Touching violations are very damaging. And whoever thinks that this isn't damaging has not worked in a treatment center because this comes up far more than you care to know. I would say a very large majority of people with chronic addiction have had an early violation and they either didn't tell anyone because they will confess to that or if they did try to tell someone it got buried right away because the family didn't want to deal with it because it involved someone in the family. The family was ashamed so they let the child keep the shame and it's shocking the amount of problems that came up out of that because the child a lot of times their psyche just fractures right there. They don't even know who they are. Oftentimes there's a demonic transference at that point, changes their whole personality. And everyone seems apparently content to think, as long as we don't blow up our family or draw attention to our family, just minimize the damage of this. But you've just cost this young person their entire future. They will never be the same and they will not feel safe. Possibly another cause is childhood bullying. That's very common. Betrayal, rejection by peers, um, no proper supervision by the adults around them, or constantly moving, constantly having to say goodbye leads to fear of making relationships because they know they're not going to last long. Even getting new siblings and not knowing how to properly adjust to that can cause this. God reminds us that he loves us. He gave us the privilege to be called his children so that we no longer are tethered to feeling that we're under this stewardship of human parents where we experience nothing but pain and loss, God gives us the option of coming under him as our father, which I guarantee you is one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me. First John 3, 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. He personally gives us a new identity and birth through his Spirit, John 1, 9 and 12 through 13, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So this isn't something that's an automatic. When people say we are all children of God, we are not. In fact, very few are. So you have to be born again, which is what this is, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's born again. A born again Christian is has a father in heaven. Others are making a choice to not have him as their father in heaven. He actually says, if they don't choose him, then their father is the devil. So not everyone can call God their father. If they are born again, they can call God their father. God says, even if our parents abandon us, he will hold, hold us close, Psalm 27, 10. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. God never forgets us nor will he neglect our needs. Isaiah 49, 15 says, Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you, God says. God comforts us through his spirit when we humble ourselves before him. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. God is faithful and steadfast in his love towards us. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So in fact, God showed this. There's no reason that anyone needs to call God narrow or, or say anything about God for that matter. Any judgment on God for the way that salvation is expected from him 
because Jesus, his only son, left heaven, came here into the worst possible life that he could, and lived for 33 years before he was brutally murdered. He felt the heartbreak of loss that sin creates between God the Father and us. He took it all on himself as he cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken him, forsaken me? Because God turned his back. And from this we know that Jesus experienced abandonment and loneliness firsthand by choice so that he could understand us. So if we choose to judge them instead and think that their way is not the way you would do it, you don't get that option. You have one choice. You can choose them or reject them. And I don't know of anyone who has paid as much as God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, to redeem us. There is no one who deserves our worship like they do. Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Matthew 27, 46 says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was so utterly abandoned. All of his disciples had abandoned him by that point, too. And yet, the very night before they abandoned him, he had washed their feet. And he knew the next day they were all going to desert him. He did this as an example to us that we can extend God's grace to those who hurt us, abandon us, but we have to be willing to follow Jesus. There's no point in doing it just for yourself. We have to be willing to follow Jesus. Jesus is the only good in us. Many want to identify with Jesus, but they don't want to follow Jesus. They want to say, I'm a Christian, but they want to live life on their own terms. They are not God's children, according to God, and none of the promises of God apply to them. Only to those who have laid down their lives for him, just as he literally laid down his life for us. We often assume that it's our pride that prevents us from humbling ourselves before God, but we are also shown in 1 Peter 5, 6-8 through 8, that our worries and our cares have the same effect. Our fear of abandonment can lead us to obsess on how we feel or how other people feel about us and we neglect God as a result. So you live w focused on what you see here instead of living by faith. You live with, I can't be around people if, they're, if they don't like me. People choose to defer and yield to that. Therefore, they neglect God. People become what they follow. They won't end up in heaven unless they turn but that's another way that we can miss God is not just pride, but fear of abandonment of people. The person who struggles with the fear of abandonment often can even struggle that God sees them. They just automatically assume God doesn't see them. And our hearts at that point fill with doubt and unbelief. When we take our eyes off God's perfect love, then the devil is allowed to come in and he floods our minds with lies that support all of our fears. I feel alone at that moment becomes I always am alone. I'm always alone. Or it feels like there's something wrong with me because I'm always alone. I will always be alone because there's something wrong with me. There is something wrong with me. No one is going to ever love me, not even God. That's how that goes. Our view of the world and others and God grows darker and darker because we become filled with sorrow, self-pity, depression, hopelessness, all because we didn't choose to believe God and what he said over and over and over. We chose to lean on our own understanding, open the door to the devil, and fall into the deep dark hole that happens as a result. Our anxious thoughts and feelings feel true because often they're based on real experiences where we did feel alone, unloved, left behind as a result of sin and brokenness. But our past experiences, although true, they don't have to be 
the truth going forward. But if we allow the devil to twist these unhealed wounds into lies, they will blind our heart from trusting in God and we will be stuck in that kind of a rut of thinking, my life is terrible. No one sees me, no one loves me. I'm too damaged to be loved. And God tells us that we can cast our anxieties on him and that he will heal us if we ask him to. But we choose to dwell on the pain and we let the pain guide our life and our choices. God wants to walk with us. He wants to be close to us. He wants to heal us. But we have to let him do that. We have to let him come close. And many don't. They choose not to. They'd rather walk in their pain for some reason. And I know many, this is a trauma response. And I'm very familiar with trauma responses. I have plenty of my own. But I also know that if I have never, there's never been a time when there are more trauma therapies and trauma trauma ways to look at trauma. There is trauma stuff everywhere. Meds for trauma. There are so many different things about trauma. When I was young, you didn't even hear the word trauma. So now there's all kinds of interventions into your trauma that if you choose to let your trauma run your life, that's a choice, a very intentional choice, because there are many ways to at least look at it every which way. Even a lot of spiritual ministries are helping with trauma. I've devoted my life to inner healing prayer ministry because nothing else eased my trauma until that happened, where I was brought to people to help break off agreements with actually core beliefs that were wrong, things that you you come to a conclusion when you're a child because you're that's all you could do was think this about this and then as you get older and that belief is still driving your behavior and then someone brings you back to revisit that belief as an adult and you look at it and you can see differently and now you can change something that's really making a lot of poor choices for you i would not trade what I have learned for anything because I can't even, I, it's so hard to describe how messed up I was just in thinking. In every way I was messed up. I, I, it's hard to even believe that, I, uh, that I'm not in a, locked up somewhere. I'm not joking either. It's been life changing because when we're in this process of helping other people you get more and more revelation from God about different things that he's helping you see in this person and then it ends up applying right back to you and then you start to understand some of the things you still didn't understand about yourself and it's constantly showing us more and more about how good God is and just how far he'll go to bring revelation to us and help us to heal from things that we run from quickly John 8:31 to 32 so Jesus said if you abide in my word you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free the word of God heals it's that simple nothing else comes close to healing anywhere close to the way the word of God heals and I was very fortunate when I was radically saved and delivered and a mess that I did not have anyone telling me how to heal. I didn't even know what to do, but I knew that this Bible, I needed to know who just healed me. And I would just write out of the Bible, and that ended up being probably the most powerful thing I could have possibly done. There's no therapist that could have matched the healing that came from me just opening up Psalms and copying it word for word out of the Bible. Proverbs 4.23 says, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. And I don't know how that affects other people. But if you think about what you're thinking about and know that that's who you're becoming and that's who you appear to be, you'll wanna be very careful what you're thinking about. I don't know how many other people have been trained in discernment by all their sin in the world, but a lot of us who have been out in the world in extensive ways 
we can our creep radar is very high and that's not a great thing to say but when I every, most of those around me can be around a person male or female short amount of time and say no and there's nothing about them generally that's visibly sideways it is something about the atmosphere around them because if you are demonized or you are not submitted to Christ you're submitted to the flesh trust me it is something that people can detect especially if it's a familiar spirit I was just talking to someone tonight about I was chronic alcoholic and she also has that same issue and I told her I told her I know every time she relapses because she calls me and she goes on this long rant at me and I said because I know that spirit I know exactly what it's saying because it used to talk to me the same way so I said I always know that voice and it says the same things every time so I just call her up and know that she's in trouble and and that's that's how we know what these people have because those of us who have been entrenched in a lot of wickedness we know what we're feeling when we walk by it we don't want it back either the other thing is we are tempted to hang on to unhealthy relationships because we fear being left alone or that the other person will be upset so when you come to Christ like I did and you were in a relationship and this was someone obviously very much out in the world and then you're thinking whoa I can't be out there anymore but you don't want to lose them either because you've got had this long relationship and it becomes like your heads in a vice because you're caught between two masters at that point so I know how this goes I've been there twice I've been there where I was in a relationship with someone who was not a born-again Christian and I knew what I was doing but I would say what other people say to me they read the Bible with me they pray with me they go to church with me he talks about God with me we we put frosting around the lie that we know and we think that we're going to fool everybody including God with our idolatry and rebellion against God I've done it I've lied to people about it because we don't want to let go of the person that's the problem it isn't even about hurting them we want them and we intend to keep them and we think they're going to come to Christ because of us except that we haven't even come to Christ yet so if we think for some reason that our witness is going to bring that person to Christ our witness will bring them to what we have which is idolatry we can't even bring them to Christ because if we did they would leave us if they really did come to Christ they would leave us because we're too compromised to for them to be with if they're genuinely saved we say I don't want to hurt them you know my heart God I want them to find you through me this is jokingly called missionary dating it's unequally yoked in the Bible and it's also sin in the Bible and God is not manipulated by it no matter how sweet and tricky we want to present it to him and others it was interesting we met with somebody here and she was in a relationship she was engaged actually and she ends up confessing to us that they live together in the same house she's saying they don't share a room but they live in the same house and told us he's going to be a pastor she said he's going to this certain kind of school to be a, a 
pastor of a Pentecostal church. And we questioned that immediately saying, how so? Like, you guys are completely compromised. How, how can he pursue being a pastor when he, he's completely compromised? And she knew that. She knew that. She knew that it was wrong and that they shouldn't be together at all for various other reasons. And said she was going to go home and do the right thing. Two weeks later, I get a call from a pastor who says, oh, I heard you met so-and-so. And I'm thinking, how would this pastor know her? So I asked, I said, how did you meet her? And they said, well, her and her fiance are here because he's studying to be a pastor. And I thought, what, what just happened here? I thought, how many questions do you ask them? Because there's a lot of issues around this. I don't think people ask. I really don't think they ask. We do because we have to decide whether or not we want to move forward with prayer ministry. And if you're intent on staying in what, in what is called the appearance of evil, we're not going to move forward because it would be reckless for us to do that. And if someone is not willing to lead by example and throw that bar all the way up there and they should never say, I'm going to be a pastor. I don't know what they think that is, if it's a career move or, but you are called to be a pastor. You're a shepherd, you're a leader. You do not compromise the flock. You never lead by sinning. There is a complete lie in that situation that is being followed. The fear of abandonment leads us to cling with two people that the Bible warns us to not associate with. We're called to love our enemies and our fellow believers, but our first loyalty must always be to Jesus. And those who struggle with abandonment often need help with boundaries, which is something I needed help with. But if we call on God and remain godly with other believers, it's a lot easier to do. Where people tend to not want to become part of a organized group of sincere believers, then they have all kinds of problems with relationships. I've done that. God gives us wisdom to know the best way to love others while learning to draw boundaries with people. And I honestly have only found that safe and right community in the last few years where I've really felt like the community itself just produces a desire for right living because it's not easy to find that anymore. 1 Corinthians 5.11 says, But now I'm writing to you, do not associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, meaning they identify as a Christian, if they are guilty of sexual immorality, including porn addiction, greed, or an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler. It says, don't even eat with them. Romans 16.17-18 says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught, avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Christians are supposed to be loving, but these people, they will say, are not loving me the way that I expect them to. They should be doing more for me. I asked them to help me, and they didn't come pick me up. They didn't take me and pay for a motel room to get me off the street. They're not really Christians. And then they tell you that you're not a real Christian. You hear that about every day when you're out here doing this kind of work. Instead of extending grace to the people who are trying to help, usually a lot of people at once, they choose to judge and condemn because you're not focused on doing exactly what they want you to do for them. These are the people that cause you to need to learn about boundaries. When you are doing more for them than they're doing for themselves, then you're the one who's in the wrong. And this happens often. <laughs> it happens way too often. They call you and tell you what they need you to do, and then you say, no, I'm not going to do that. And then they hang up, and you hear they're talking all kinds of crazy about you. So I'm one that does experience this a lot because I used to do this to people. <laughs> and so I know where it comes from. I don't serve it, but I'm very familiar with it, and I know that it happens a lot. So 
because we've been so hurt by past rejection, a lot of times we set unrealistically high expectations for ourselves and others too. And then when others reject us for small mistakes, we learn to see all mistakes as unacceptable. And this broken way of thinking becomes normal and it leads us to be a critical judge, a very harsh judge and an unfair judge of ourselves and even others. And the Bible considers our judgments of others even ourself, sin. Judgment is serious in God's eyes because it creates a distance between God and us. When you are judging others, you are creating a big space between you and God and between those that you're judging. And consequently, our loneliness is only compounded by that because God moving away from you creates a loneliness, even if you're in a large group of people. And this is why we need to address the fear of abandonment. James 4, 11 through 12 says, Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you're criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone, who gave the law, is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? In the church, we're asked to do that, but not outside the church. We often use ungodly coping mechanisms to manage our relationships, however. We say, I need to alleviate this anxiety I have. I will do something to make myself feel better now. And what we don't realize right away is that the thing that we're doing to make ourselves feel better is catering to the flesh man, the one we're supposed to destroy, rather than submitting to God's spirit and allowing him to work out all things for our good. We've now jumped outside of that lane Instead, we use our broken ways to fix our situation and we end up grieving God. God who created us and redeemed us, he cares about us and he cares about what we worry about and he wants to help us if we will let him and he knows the right way to help us. The enemy wants us to believe that God wants to take away all the fun in our life, all the fun people and over and over again, God's word asks us, trust me and not ourselves he will provide for us every time romans 8 5 through 8 says those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things but those who are controlled by the holy spirit think about things that please the spirit so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. They are not born again. They are not going to heaven. They can call themselves whatever they want. They are the ones that he will say, I never knew you. Ungodly coping mechanisms can actually look like good things. For example, independence is a good thing. But children are meant to grow up to be independent in some ways, but not in others. And those who have felt abandoned in the past often adopt a form of independence that rejects healthy and good connections with others. It says, I have to take care of myself. I cannot trust anyone. I cannot depend on anyone. And I'm certainly not going to be vulnerable. Pride says, I will prove that I'm worthy of their attention, respect, and love. It becomes a performer. I'm better than them anyway. Who needs other people? Mistrust says, I can't trust anyone. People are always going to disappoint me. Look, there they go again. I knew this was going to happen. It always happens. People need to prove that they're trustworthy and not going to hurt me or I'm not going to let them in my life. Love paralysis says, I will love others once I'm confident that they will love me back and not leave me, I will plan out the worst case scenarios and do something to, to prevent them from happening to me. I will avoid people. I won't let people get close to me. And then there's people pleasing. I will agree with other people at all costs so that they will like me. How many know people don't like you for that? They don't like you. Or I will cater to their feelings to keep myself safe. I won't talk about what I truly feel or need so that people don't reject me. People don't like people like that. They will use you. They will use you and not respect you. Because broken people seek out others to fix their brokenness. They love getting married 
only to subconsciously curse their own marriage. God made marriage to be a reflection of Jesus' love for the church body, a restored picture of his perfect love where husbands love their wives and wives respect their husbands. That is demanded. If you think that you are the best evangelist, minister, prophet, whatever it is you're going by, but you do not have your spouse in a position of respect and love and honor, you are a banging gong. You are completely out of order and everyone else can see it. Your spouse should be safe in that relationship. Either way, husband or wife, they should know. And if they don't, and they're the ones that feel like they don't matter, they're the child that's little that no one talks to, you have completely missed your calling. You chose what you wanted over your marriage. That will cost you in the end. I don't care how much fruit you think you have, you missed it completely. Ephesians 5, 25 through 33 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water, of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Our spouse needs to feel cherished. Or we're not right. We're out of order. Just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And the fear of abandonment ruins this picture. It leads people to think quickly of divorce when times are difficult. It causes them to draw up prenups before they even get married. They constantly fear that their spouses are being unfaithful, they're so emotionally insecure, clingy, aggressive, and to cope, they distance themselves emotionally from their spouses just to protect their heart from more disappointment. And they draw further and further away from each other. And then some choose to become sexually promiscuous with others. They flirt with others. They commit adultery with pornography or another person. And by behaving in all these ways, they grieve God and they violate their marriage covenant. And he puts marriages for good. It is often our own fears that lead us to separate emotionally from our own spouse because of all the unhealed and unrelated emotional pain from the past. We drag it all into the marriage, absolutely destroy it, and then hate the person that never did it to begin with. They just had to live with all the angst. Marriage is hard enough, but if you drag all your pain into it, it's almost impossible. People who struggle with abandonment need to be patient. They need to learn to recognize that some of our underlying hurts are not even true. We're in danger of projecting our brokenness onto human beings when our perfect and loving Father in heaven is very ready to heal. But since we fear he will neglect or abandon us, just like parents or other guardians, then we don't go to him because we're not sure he will heal us, so we're not even going to go there. We can confess that we have had trouble trusting him, even to him. You can go to him and say, I'm struggling to trust you. You can say that to him. He will help you with that. We should also ask God for forgiveness because we have made him out to be unfaithful, unkind, unreliable, unloving, untruthful when he has proven himself more than enough by giving up Jesus for us. And this is a description of human beings who have hurt us, not a description of God who has proven himself. So invite the Holy Spirit to search your heart and remind you of the people who have made you feel abandoned in the past and in the present. Forgive them. 
bless them so that God can forgive you. Otherwise, you're walking around unforgiven. It's a command to forgive. Just as Jesus washed his disciples' feet, we can ask God if he has a plan for us to show his love and grace to those who have actually forsaken us. We should also repent for chasing other people's acceptance and approval over that of God. This is idolatry. This is a sin that will keep you from heaven. Don't seek people, not one person, over God. You want his favor first or you get nothing in the end. You won't get the person and you won't get him. Galatians 1.10 says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. John 12.43 says, For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And many of us have crossed into this where we wanted love from a human more than we did from God. And somehow in our minds we thought we were going to have both. You don't. When we bow to God's will for our lives in this way, we will be delivered from our fears. Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord, he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. And in the parable of the sower, Jesus shows clearly that those who chase, on, they chase the cares of this world, they want to be popular, they want to feel accepted, they want to fit in, they will fall into a trap they will end up with nothing. They will not even be healed. They're gonna need more and more and more of the same thing they're chasing to keep going. I promise that if God can use me in any kind of a way, he can use anyone because I usually am the most messed up person I know. And God chose me because I, I meet that profile where he says he chooses what the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. Because with me, no matter what happens, he looks good <laughs> because of what was. And if I'm sitting anywhere not having crazy screaming outbursts, he looks powerful compared to what I was. I can tell you that attaching to people is a challenge for me, but I cannot even put into words what it feels like to be chosen by God. I don't even know how. I knew it immediately. I knew it from that God chose me. I knew it. I don't, there's no way I could have known that. He went so far as to give me a complete knowing that he chose me and I tell people I was born again with a silver spoon in my mouth. I know I'm favored by God. I know God loves me. I know God sees me. I know God helps me. I walk in faith because he has never let me down. Never has he let me down. He always hears me. I likely would have never found a way to live except that he became everything to me. And I wish that people understood I had no way to connect to him or others. He did it to me. He connected. And it's hard to put into words what he means to me. And I often see the verse, what if you gained the whole world but lost your soul? At the end of my life, when I was dying from drugs and alcohol, I tell people, you could have handed me a million dollars cash that day and I would have just pushed it away because I was so sick. I was so sick. There was nothing a million dollars could have done to make that day have any light in it at all. There was nothing I could have done with the money. I couldn't even stand up. There's nothing in this world, nothing that I would trade for five minutes of missing him, of not knowing he was with me, nothing. I know that for a fact. No matter how good someone treats you, a person, no matter how biblical you think they are, they're going to fail you. 
people fail people. I fail people all the time. I just can't cover all these bases. The fact remains, we're people and people fail people. People fail God, people fail period. No human will ever be able to give you the same faithfulness that God gives you. 100% faithful. And if you're trying to find your security in another human, when that human shows you their sinfulness, then your abandonment's just gonna get worse again. Only God can give us that perfect security that we crave. Even the best of people sin, and then those that are the best also die. And this happens in life and people are shattered because all their eggs were in that one basket. Only God is perfect, only God is eternal, and only God controls everything by his power. And our hearts were made for only God. And until they find their rest in him, there will be no rest at all. God will help you overcome your fear of abandonment by helping you embrace the truth found in Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, it says, where he said, I will never leave you or forsake you so that we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. Precious Lord, I have gone around this mountain in so many different ways, and I know the faces of abandonment coming and going. I know it from every side, and I, I'm so familiar with it. But I'm so grateful that with one choice, you gave me something to hang on to that makes the rest of it not so important anymore. I will struggle through figuring out human relationships, but I have the one that keeps me standing, that keeps me steady, that keeps me moving a certain direction. You are the one that matters. You are the only one I want to please. I ask you to miraculously touch everyone who needs the same thing you gave me, where you reach down and you knitted my heart to yours and you have never left. You have stayed close and this life has been amazing walking with you. So I ask that you do that for a whole bunch of people right now, that you heal them in Jesus' name. Those who are broken, who everything would change if they knew that a touch from you is going to change everything, I ask that you do that in the name of Jesus. I ask that your Holy Spirit would rest on everyone who isn't sure, is this really true that God would come that close to me? that he would deliver me from my fears. I ask that you come that close to them, come even closer than that to them. I ask that you work miracles in the lives of those around us and the lives of those who hear us and the lives of those who help us. We ask you for miracles in every way that is needed and help us, Jesus, to stay faithful, to follow your voice, Thank you for keeping us safe and for always being our defender, our protector, our vindicator, our provider. We love you. I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.